Okay. Welcome back, folks, um, from our break. Um, today, for our next session, we're going to have a. Oh, I skipped back a slide. Oh, how about this? <laughs> we'll just do that. That's a simple solution. All right. So, um, our next. Oh, be quiet for PowerPoint. Um, our next talk is going to, or this is going to be a panel discussion on security, and it's going to be hosted by um, Ed Mass, Mark Johnston, and Marius Saborski. So I will turn it over to you three. All right, thanks, John. Um, so again, this I'm hoping is going to be um, a somewhat interactive um, uh, discussion, but um, we have have some slides to to present a few um, uh, a few uh, specific points that uh, we've prepared. Um, so there's four kind of main um, main topics for this this session. Um, a little bit about uh, Sec Team and, and some of the changes that have happened to it um, over time, and and other changes that might uh, might um, come down uh, for for Sec Team moving forward. Um, uh, how issues are found and reported and and dealt with. Um, Vulnerability mitigations that have been added to FreeBSD over the last uh, last while, and some proactive approaches to improving security. Um, so here's a, um, a screen grab from the uh, website on what the security team is, um, and uh, this um, you know is is sort of a um, uh, a high level statement, but doesn't really get into kind of the the, the details of what um, uh, what it actually means. Um, Sec team is responsible for uh, for security of FreeBSD overall. Um, although Ports um, has its own uh, own specific team that handles um, vulnerability issues in individual ports in the Ports collection, um, separate from. Uh, uh, sec team and I think this is something that you know moving forward um, we should try to make sure we have good coordination and collaboration um, at least but um, but it, it makes sense that uh, the ports uh, the ports team um, you know has a slightly different set of um, of issues and, and upstream to just, uh, issues dealing with upstreams and such so it's, it's it's fundamentally going to be a slightly different case um, and then this is from the reporting a security issue uh, website or web page. Um, distinct makes a little distinction between what um, uh, the security officer um, uh, alias is and the security team. Uh, and I think this is something that in the past um, had a maybe a slightly larger distinction um, in that that uh, SO was a very um, Either a single person or a very small um, group, and Sec Team was very large. Um, at this point, uh, Sec Team and SO are uh, they're both um, greater than one and less than ten uh, sort of um, uh, sort of cases. But um, one of the things that's happened to to Sec Team um, over time, on you know, with, with Gordon as the current um, uh, secu uh, head security officer. Um, one of the things we've done is incorporate or brought um, uh, the responsibility for fixes and um, uh, dealing with issues uh, to the individual developer community. Uh, in the past, you know, a, um, a, a security issue would be um, would be reported, and sec team would deal with it, and a commit would show up, and, and that might be the first um, uh, someone would. A developer who is knowledgeable about that area might be the first time they're they're aware of it, um, or you know, might on a, on an individual basis um, they might be brought in to to work on things. But you know, it wasn't it wasn't kind of the um, the natural fundamental way that the team operates. Um, so one of the things Gordon's done is is made it so that um, uh, every FreeBSD developer has an account um, on the um, the bug tracker that that um, where security. Uh, related bugs um, are, are dealt with uh, and can be cc'd on on bugs that have um, that are in their their area of expertise and I think there's a, there's a few reasons um, uh, this makes sense um, you know, 
the, the nature of um, uh, the nature of, of bugs and vulnerabilities um, is, is different than when when this, this team you know started years and years and years ago um, and and there's uh, a lot like there's a lot of domain specific knowledge that's really necessary to, to have effective um, uh, responses to um, uh, two issues um, so the first line on this is it, the, the sec team to, to PCERT, uh, um, uh, product security incident response team. Um, I think that's kind of just highlighting um, a uh, transition that's been underway for, for quite some time. Um, uh, the responsibility for reviewing security related aspects of various um, code areas or uh, you know, architectural kind of uh, questions. Um, that used to fall entirely to, to SEC team, but um, uh, I think that's um, SEC team doesn't necessarily have the the um, the background in, in all of the um, in the specific functional areas, um, and so the the CSPRNG review team is is sort of the first example of um, of that happening. Um, so there's you know a, a team of people uh, who are responsible for um, reviewing changes to um, the the random uh, random number uh, infrastructure, um, and that's so. It's, instead of sort of it being sec team's responsibility wholly for um, reviewing those sorts of things, the, the it's the, res the responsibility for that is delegated to um, uh, individuals who are knowledgeable and aware of the um, specific um, specific functional area. Um, that's basically the, the very brief overview I have of, of um, those sort of functional changes. Um, I'm curious if there's any questions or, um, uh, or comments um, before we'll get on to uh, the next section, which is um, Mark talking about some um, aspects of uh, discovering um, uh, issues internally with our, within our own community. I'm just checking on IRC or on the Zoom Q&A. Um, I don't see any, uh, any questions uh, here at the moment. So with that, I will um, uh, let Mark uh, take on, take over. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, um, so I mean, obviously, you know, finding security vulnerabilities is a bit of an art. Um, but for the past few years, we've been automating um, that to, to a fairly large extent. Um, and by that, I'm, I'm talking about SysCaller, which is something I've, I've talked about at past Dev Summits um, multiple times, so I won't go into it in very much detail. Um, but in short, it's, it's uh, a coverage-guided fuzzer for the kernel. It generates programs uh, consisting of chains of system calls and really has the you know, one goal, which is to crash the kernel. Um, it's very effective at doing that. It was originally developed for Linux, um, but it's been uh, extended to, to fuzz all of the BSDs and quite a few other operating systems besides. Um, and uh, Google uh, very generously runs a, a public instance called SysBot, um, uh, from which this uh, screenshot was taken. Uh, so what it, what it does 24 seven is, uh, you know, fuzzes uh, the latest FreeBSD kernel uh, which gets rebuilt every 24 hours or so. Um, multiple instances are running in uh, Google's uh, in, in GCE, and uh, yeah, the, the fuzzer is running continuously. Syscaller detects crashes when they happen, basically by monitoring the serial console, and generates reports, which uh, gets sent to a, a mailing list, and then developers look at those reports and try to fix the bug. Uh, so if you visit uh, the SysBot uh, FreeBSD webpage, you'll see there's several hundred bugs that have been fixed or are marked invalid for one reason or another. Um, and if, if you look at commit logs, you'll probably have seen quite a few references to syscaller. Uh, so it's a very good bug finding tool. And because it tends to exercise rarely executed portions of the kernel, um, it's very good at finding security vulnerabilities as well. And we've had uh, a number of CVEs in the past few years that were uh, found by uh, found by syscaller. Um, it's, it's really quite good at, at kind of exposing all the kind of gremlins that are hiding within the kernel. Um, you know, our system call interface is pretty big. Individual system calls are simple, but when you chain them together, you can create some pretty bizarre interactions um, that won't be, that, that'll never occur uh, 
you know, when, when you're running actual programs that people will use. Um, but of course, those are the kinds of interactions that security, uh, you know, f folks trying to find vulnerabilities for, for good or for evil um, will look for. So uh, Syscaller really does a good job fleshing them out. Um, and uh, so, and I mean, you know, having been on SAG team for the past couple of years, um, I can see that quite a few bug reports that come to us from various security researchers uh, were, were found by Syscaller. Even if they don't say it, it's usually possible to tell um, just by looking at the uh, the sample code that's provided. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll give a hint for uh, what I'm talking about there. So one of the really cool features of Syscaller is that when it finds a crash, it tries quite hard and often successfully to find a reproducer for it, which is a standalone C program that you can take and compile and run in your own system and reproduce the same crash. Um, so they tend to, I mean, they're, they're automatically generated programs. You can't really read them very easily, um, but they, Syscaller is very, very effective at uh, generating them. So yeah, when I, when I see a, um, uh, a notification of a bug or a security bug from a, from a researcher and the reproducer looks something like that, um, you know, that's, that's usually a pretty good sign that they found it. Uh, with Syscaller. And that's, again, happening pretty, pretty often these days. So uh, it's quite important for us to, you know, try to stay ahead of that. Um, uh, I and, and a number of other FreeDC developers have been doing quite a bit of work uh, fixing Syscaller reports. You know, the, there's one instance in public Sysbot, but uh, a number of us run uh, private Syscaller instances. Um, we, we, you know, at times extend Syscaller to test different parts of FreeBSD. Um, and, and usually you find a new, new bugs. Um, when we do fix bugs, you know, some code auditing is usually in order. Bugs tend to cluster. So when you fix or when you find one bug and fix it, usually you'll find several related ones nearby. So it's always worth uh, spending time doing that. Uh, and those, those reproducers tend to, tend to result in uh, pretty useful regression tests as well. So there's a collection, there's, there's several collections of them out, um, out in the world and, and uh, uh, folks who, Test FreeBSD often, or we'll, we'll sometimes run those uh, reproducers to see if they turn up anything new. And uh, the other, uh, uh, one more slide, please. The other thing I wanted to talk about, or, or perhaps advancement in FreeBSD in the past couple of years, uh, has been the introduction of uh, kernel sanitizers. Um, I shouldn't say introduction, there's been uh, an implementation of the undefined behavior sanitizer, and I think the concurrency sanitizer. Um, but last year, I spent some time uh, porting the kernel address sanitizer and kernel memory sanitizer from NetBSD. Um, and those are uh, very effective at finding um, things like buffer overflows, use after freeze, the sorts of bugs that can, can very often be turned into um, uh, uh, a security exploit. So uh, they combined with Syscaller, uh, you know, just, just help us find more bugs more easily with, with more reliable reproducers. Um, so, you know, I think continuing to invest in these, in these kinds of technologies has been very important for FreeBSD, and it's something that SEC team um, you know, actively spends time on, um, at least I certainly do. Uh, and so I think we're in, in a, you know, pretty good place right now, just based on public reports available, um, but there's, there's a ton of extra, you know, a, a, a lot of directions we can go. Um, there's lots of portions of FreeBSD that don't really get fuzzed today. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's it's an area where we're going to see um, a lot of a lot of uh, advancement over the next few years. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that that was it for for Syscaller. That's the that's the main thrust of the proactive bug finding that that I do on a regular basis. Um, code auditing is another important part of it, um, which I mentioned already, um, and also just paying attention to bug reports. Um, a lot of folks will, you know. Uh, Hit a hit a crash. They don't know necessarily that it's a you know security relevant in some way. It's just a kernel panic, you know. And so they'll report it, and upon some examination, you'll find oh hey, uh, an unprivileged user can actually use this to to um, to obtain privileged access to the system. So it, it becomes uh, a security advisory. Um, and this this is something that also happens pretty regularly. Um, you know, we've we've had bugs found by uh, Peter Holmes Trust too. Test or test suite that turned into uh, CVEs, um, bug reports on you know in our in our bugzilla. Um, so uh, just just I think a, a big part of SecTeam's role is to is to monitor those kinds of channels and you know make sure that bug reports 
you know, do, do get addressed in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. And I think that was all I wanted to say there. Yeah. Um, if we, depending on how much time we, we have here, we can maybe do a live um, look at uh, um, CISBA at the, the end of it if, if we have a little bit more time. But um, I think I did want to just touch on one thing you mentioned, um, which is sort of areas for future um, uh, development with, with respect to, to Zen Scholar and more FreeBSD coverage. I think one of the things um, that is uh, is a, would be a very valuable um, path forward, and this is already done in um, in Syscaller for other um, other operating systems. Um, is being able to uh, Syscaller has the ability with with some uh, additional work to, um, on the the you know the client or guest side um, to to do things like um, uh, inject uh, Wi-Fi uh, frames or uh, you know provide a us a virtual usb um device and it can it can fuzz the um the communication um protocol running over those interfaces um and i think that's something that would be very valuable for us to um uh, to explore as well yeah for sure um yeah there, there's there's linux is quite a bit more um advanced in that regard in, in terms of its use of syscaller and uh, so i mean you know, in FreeBSD, we, we mostly fuzz the system call interface and syscaller knows how to use, um, I think it's like the, the tap interface to inject packets into the network stack. Um, but yeah, for Wi-Fi, we need, we need uh, um, a bit more glue and we don't currently have that. Yeah, USB is the same story. Um, I had a GSOC project last year um, to add support for fuzzing the, the Linux later. So the, the implementation of Linux system calls. So that's actually functional. It's just not integrated yet. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, there, there's quite a few different paths, you know, you can go down. There was an interesting uh, tweet by Dmitry Vyukov, who, who, you know, wrote Syscaller originally. Um, and he was talking about, a, you know, an interesting project idea would be to take, you know, all of the CVEs that have been assigned to, you know, FreeBSD, all, or at least the FreeBSD kernel, and sort of make Syscaller smart enough to go back and find those vulnerabilities if they, if they still existed today. Um, just based on the observation, again, that bugs tend to occur in clusters. So, um, you know, uh, if, if there was the vulnerability in the past that was found by, say, code inspection and was fixed, um, if we trained somehow, if we trained Syscaller to, to find that same bug, there's a good chance it'll find uh, uh, related things. And um, yeah, I, I, can, I can absolutely think of examples of that just off the top of my head. Uh, so that, like, you know, there, there's, there's quite a few different avenues to, to go down if, if this is something uh, anyone's interested in pursuing. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely an opportunity for others to um, to collaborate on uh, on this as well. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of work to do, and and you know, I mean, I think over time um, things will continue to get added, but um, but certainly there's there's opportunity for for collaboration and, and more people working in parallel on on various aspects here. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think Dimitri um, Dimitri's comment is um, you know is, is sort of a very critical thing for us to think about. Um, you know, basically, yeah, using the examples of, of vulnerabilities that have actually occurred in the past um, to, to, to ask ourselves, how can we make sure that we would identify, or how, how can we identify this type of, this class of vulnerability or this, this you know, type of issue, um, uh, wherever it may appear in, in the tree. Um, there is a question uh, from IRC, um, uh, Basically, about the the workload of triaging the um, the, re the, re the reports from uh, Sysbot, like how much effort is it, um, and does the bot do any classification or prioritization of the reports? Um, there's no prioritization per se. Um, as far as classification goes, um, reports are you know uh, they're grouped together by panic message effectively. So. You know any bug which results in a particular panic message, um, uh, you know, gets a unique report, and there's there's some kind of mangling that happens to make sure that like you know fatal trap twelve doesn't, you know, you, you don't kind of merge unrelated bugs with the same panic message into one. Um, so, you know, as far as triage goes, it's it's mostly manual. I, I there's like I said, there's a mail list that receives mail anytime a new report is found. Um, and another email when a reproducer is found. So a number of us monitor it. Uh, um, certain bugs, you know, bugs with reproducers do tend to get fixed fairly quickly. Um, 
there's a few subsystems that are a bit problematic in that regard, but most of the core kernel, or I, I would say all of the core kernel is, is you know, treated uh, quite promptly. Um, so it, it's it's largely manual, and unfortunately, like it, it's you, you have to have some, you know, in order to contribute to it, you have to have some some comfort with kernel development, right? Because more often than not, when you look at a report, it's gonna be in some random subsystem of the kernel that you totally you know, aren't familiar with. You've got this reproducer, but it just kind of calls a bunch of system calls and, and who knows what they're actually supposed to do. So you, you do tend to spend a lot of time just you know, building a mental model of how things should work uh, before you actually can, can fix the bug. Um, but certainly, you know, things that aren't addressed in a timely manner, you know, and any, any kind of like, effort to to highlight bugs that aren't getting fixed quickly would be would be useful um, I don't think the burden of these reports is is overly large I know there's been some commentary in the Linux community that like you know especially with sanitizers enabled they get so many sysbot reports that it's actually pretty difficult to to stay on top of everything and figure out what's fixed and what's not you know there's there's quite a few different branches to track um, in FreeBSD, it's it's not as overwhelming I think um, Partly because we have some some people dedicated to working on this kind of stuff, and partly just because you know we we, we don't have as much um, uh, uh, surface. All right, uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, yeah, there is one more on Zoom, oh, I believe. Okay. Uh, about uh, which subsystems right now uh, we should target or you know focus on uh, in case of fuzzing. Um, so, I mean, uh, so USB and Wi-Fi were already mentioned, and those were those those are two that would definitely benefit. Um, they they aren't quite trivial in that, like they they require some device emulation uh, glue in order for for Sysbot to to sort of reach into them effectively. Um, ZFS is another one right now. All of the images that Syscaller fuzzes are are UFS based. Um, but I think in the near future we'll, we'll have it'll be much easier to build, um, you know, ZFS-based VM images for for use in fuzzing. So I I, I anticipate that that's going to be resolved in the next couple of months. Um, I think drivers in general are are under tested, um, especially uh, I don't know what our terminology is like virtual interface or virtual network drivers. So things like lag, VLAN. Um, uh, you know, wire guard, uh, any any kind of or neck graph, any any of those sort of middle layers um, in the kernel. Right now, um, they they don't get fuzzed particularly well, and that's mostly a question of you know putting putting some time in to teach syscaller to to create such interfaces. So I mean, with PF, for instance, um, I think it was Christoph he added uh, a number of descriptions of all the the PFIO controls, which are you know the main interface for configuring PF. And so now most of the PF control interface is fuzzed and that's actually found a number of bugs. It's hard to say whether, you know, they're, they're really all that consequential, um, but uh, uh, certainly it, it provides, you know, useful regression testing if nothing else. Um, so syscaller is coverage guided. Um, you, can, you can kind of look at code coverage metrics to see if there's any subsystems that, that are missing. And, and again, there's certainly quite a few that I can think of off the top of my head. So, um, you know, which one to pick? Uh, it, I think that's that's kind of hard to say. Um, you know, there, there's a good chance any any time you add descriptions for a new interface, you're you're most likely going to find find some bugs, whether they're you know um, important or not. It's it's hard to say, but you'll find something. Uh, okay. Um... A uh, question regarding security issues which are seen in multiple BSD OSs due to code inheritance. Is this coordinated? Um, sometimes better, sometimes worse. Um, I think um, you know there there are there have been some some very good examples of um, uh, of issues that were reported or discovered by third parties um, that involved kind of. Um, uh, large scale uh, multi OS um, efforts. And, you know, we've, um, we, we have collaborated with OpenBSD and NetBSD folks on, on some specific issues in the past. Um, also with um, uh, 
uh, we've actually had some good collaboration even with, with folks like uh, from Citrix um, uh, on uh, some, you know, there was no code inheritance in that case, but just sort of technical details and, and sharing some, some discussion. Um, I think that um, the, the issues that we've, we've dealt with um, more recently um, are probably uh, um, uh, probably um, not ones that are um, uh, are common to other other BSDs. I think one of the um, um, you know I, I think a lot of a sort of uh, user land um, you know classic buffer overflows and things in in the base system. Um, those kinds of, of things are, you know, have largely been uh, a lot of that code to the extent that it's shared with other BSDs hasn't changed in, in years and years, right? So um, a lot of the kinds of vulnerabilities that would show up in, in those things have been dealt with long, long ago. Um, and so I think, you know, to the extent that we have either um, vulnerabilities in kernel subsystems, um, the recent Wi-Fi issue that we had, um, none of those are um, are shared with um, with with, uh, with OpenBSD or NetBSD, for example. Um, we have um, uh, in the past um, dealt with like uh, uh, Dragonfly, for instance. Um, you know, has a much closer lineage with FreeBSD um, than OpenBSD or NetBSD will, and so we've we've uh, passed on details of, of issues um, uh, to with, with, or, or work collaborated with them um, in the past. I think it is it is something that, you know, absolutely we are, it, it would be beneficial both to FreeBSD and to others to have kind of a, an ongoing collaboration on on these sorts of things. And we have some some communication channels to have those discussions. Um, but I think that the reality of the situation is just that, you know, recent issues haven't really been um, and things that um, are, are common to, to other, um, uh, at least to OpenBSD and FBSD. Let's see here. So I think that's all the questions from, um, I have from IRC, I don't see any others on Zoom right now. So um, we'll have a quick, um, quick slide here on vulnerability mitigations that have um, gone into the tree in the last, um, last little while um, either are in progress or um, you know in um, uh, went into the tree in, in the last year two years three years sorts of thing um, these are all links to the, um, the commits that made these changes um, and uh, I'm not going to go through them one by one but um, you know you can look at the slides later on and have a look at these um, the ASLR implementation or ASR implementation that's in um, in Maine now is, is and is merged to stable 13. Um, uh, the semi half folks um, have prepared the um, uh, MFC of enabling it by, um, by default. Uh, so it's not in 13.1, but 13.2 will have it um, uh, turned on by default. Um, uh, Mark did the work to, um, to address the, the stack address randomization, um, replacing the, the initial um, stack gap um, implementation with a, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the exact word I want to use to describe this, but just a, uh, you know, a more uh, consistent maybe um, approach. Um, and uh, semi half folks are doing the same thing, uh, same kind of thing with um, the, the, the shared page where the VDSO um, uh, lives um, now. So that's in, in review. That's what there's the, the link uh, here is a, is a link to the fabricator review. Um, and then the yeah, enabled by default is, um, uh, is the change in main that, that turned it on and, and will, will, um, will get merged. Um, the, let's see, one of the ones I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I guess there's uh, both both the MMAP, mProtect, maximum page protection and init all zero init all pattern. Um, the second one is just a build knob basically that uses a flag that, that, um, that Clang introduced. Um, both of these changes, uh, the, the MMAP and protect page protection, and, and this one, are things that came from uh, Cherry BSD. And I think we're not done necessarily um, as you know for for a security for vulnerability mitigation um, reason. Just sort of, uh, it might have been uh, at least in the case of a 
of MMAP and MPROTECT, it's, it's sort of uh, an incidental change to um, that, that's necessary to kind of fundamentally um, uh, accommodate um, what, uh, what Cherry BSD and, uh, requires as far as the interface to, to MMAP or MPROTECT. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, this came into FreeBSD from Cherry BSD and, and is, um, uh, is not yet um, sort of fully deployed in a, in a mitigation context, but it's something that um, I, I, I'm interested in trying to pursue. Um, and so basically what, what the change does is um, it adds a, a macro that lets you specify not only the protection flags um, that you're currently intending to use um, for MMAP or MProtect, but, um, but also the, the maximum ones. So if you don't, um, you can request a, um, uh, you can request, uh, rest you know, uh, a subset of protections for the current uh, mapping, but allow, uh, but, but report to the kernel that you will um, need a broader set in the future. Um, or you can, you know, uh, not uh, provide the, the extended set. And the intent is then that if you, you know, if you ask for memory that's um, uh, maximum protection is, is read, um, then you, that memory won't be, uh, won't be able to be um, changed in the, in the future to add protections that, that don't, um, uh, that aren't requested at the time that it's, it's allocated or, um, or set. Um, and this comes out of the, the need, um, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a direct consequence of um, Cherry ABI's um, uh, interface where if you're passing in a capability to reference um, uh, some, um, uh, passing in or, or, or receiving a capability to some memory, um, you know, if, if, if you don't have, um, uh, if you don't have the ability to, to write through that capability when you get it, you can't just, you can't add it later. Um, and so that, you know, this is, is something that um, is, is a consequence of, of, of Cherry, but I think is, is interesting in, in the, um, uh, the, the general FreeBSD context uh, as well. Um, Mark or uh, Marius, any, anything you want to comment on any of these? Um, I don't think I have anything to add there now. Um, nice. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, um, uh, I'll try and turn at least like the, the last two that aren't links right now um, into links for the, the slides that actually get published um, showing the actual commits or at least the uh, uh, you know, relevant or significant commit related. Um, to this. Um, uh, in IRC, um, Salosan says that uh, we should have a, a dedicated web page, I mean, a wiki page maybe, um, that shows the, the vulnerability mitigations that we have. Um, I think that's a, yeah, a reasonable, um, uh, a reasonable comment. Um, uh, basically, you know, I can start with this little list I put together here. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, Andy points out in IRC that we have uh, kernel pack and for thread SSP on ARM64 as well. Um, there's, you know, there's there's a number of other things that have have, have gone in. Um, I mentioned um, SMAP and uh, uh, PAN here, um, also uh, SMAP uh, and PXN uh, uh, privilege. Uh, star uh, uh never um uh, it's not an exhaustive list here but uh yeah i think that's a good point we can um uh, we, we absolutely should have this on a uh, on page with um information about um probably what versions these showed up in and and you know if there's any um uh, for some of these um there there's no user facing control or knob or anything it just you know it's a change that just exists and, and provides its and serves its purpose. Um, some of these have syscontrol knobs that can be turned on or off or you know, involve um, either making use of them um, at application, uh, like at the uh, application creation time. Um, so for example, the, the MMAP and MProtect page protection, you know, that's, that's something that um, may well be something that is, is applied as you're writing the software, not um, as a some an op that an end user would turn on. Um, so providing that kind of information for all of these, you know, uh, how to use them, how to how they they're configured, etc., would be would be reasonable. And then we can flush it out with um, with the full set of, of different ones. 
um, uh, the group asks if it would make sense to add these security things to um, either the Arch or security ban pages. Um, I think that's that's also um, uh, also useful. I mean, I think um, things like um, uh, this, the supervisor mode um, uh, uh, access prevention uh, things that that almost kind of fits into Arch, right? Like in that um, x86 and ARM64 have very similar types of things. And I think, you know, being having having a list of uh, this architecture implements this type of uh, of protection, and it's called this for this architecture, that, that seems like something that's, um, that's reasonable. Um, yeah, I think that um, whether it's arch security or uh, mitigations that someone suggested, um, I think both having a, a list on the website and perhaps with more information, but also a um, a man page for it makes, uh, makes sense, yeah. Before we jump uh, into the next topic, I mm -hmm. believe there is another question to Mark about the um, fuzzers. Uh, basically, who has access to the reproducers generated by large fuzzer instance? Uh, there, I mean, so Fizzbot is the one public instance that I'm aware of, and there's no um, there's no restriction of access. So yeah, you, you have access to all the reproducers. Um, and I don't really think it makes much sense to like, um, you know, it's, it's not like it's a, a sorry. The point here is that the reproducers can just basically have a zero day uh, box. Right? Certainly. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, it's, it's not hard to, to set up a local syscaller or syscaller instance that will find those same reproducers as well. So I, I don't think there's really all that much to be gained from um, uh, uh, hiding them. And I, I, yeah, as far as I can tell, that's been the syscaller project's policy as well. The same is true of Linux. All of those reproducers are available, and I mean they've they've had CVEs where um, you know that that were you know where the underlying bug was was available or discovered and and had a reproducer and was in public. Um, so yeah, given how easy it is to, to set up an instance locally and find the same bugs yourself, um, I, yeah, I don't think there's, there's much sense in, um, in restricting that. And I mean, it's because, because, you know, this whole scheme is quite non-deterministic. You know, one instance of syscaller might find bugs that are not found by a different instance, or you might have some, um, slightly different configuration, like say the number of CPUs or the amount of memory, um, uh, things like that, which kind of, you know, end up triggering different races um, or, or whatever, you know, inject whatever amount of non-determinism is needed to, to discover a new bug. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's the answer to that. Anyone can, can look at those reproducers, anyone can run syscaller and find bugs and, and get their own reproducers. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, if, um, you know, if, if, if running syscaller was either extremely complicated to do, or you know, was it was um, uh, only available under some license agreement, and and very few, you know, there's restricted um, uh, access to Syscaller, or it was extremely expensive to run, or something. Then you know, I could see someone making a, an argument that oh, we should um, embargo the the reproducers and the the results, um, and, but. Um, and I'm not saying that I would make that argument. I'd say that there's there's a plausible argument to be made there. Um, but I think in the you know the reality is that um, it's trivial for anyone else to start finding these, and there's really nothing at all to be gained to try and um, limit the access to to the reproducers. Like the the what we really need to do is run more syscaller instances um, and. Um, or have just, more eyes that are looking and, at and have more people looking at uh, at reports and get fixes in as quickly as we can um it came up in the last topic um uh, a little bit that one of the things that would be very very nice to do um is when a kernel change is you know in review or submitted as a pull request or someone has um a bunch of changes in a, a whip branch um somewhere to be able to in a ideally automated fashion um, spin up a syscaller instance and you know run syscaller uh, run sysbot against uh, or run syscaller against the proposed change for you know four hours a day whatever whatever kind of makes sense but um, but yeah I mean um, we we really want to be in a case in a position where we have a you know either 
uh, ideally not no um, kind of known open just always happen types of issues um, but are at least at least very very rare right so that um, you can run it for a day and um, either it doesn't find anything new or you know maybe occasionally it finds something new but or finds a report but it's something that you are um, anyway that that is something that I think will be be very uh, very compelling for us to, to do also um, I really want to make it easier for uh, I want to I shouldn't say I want to make it easier. I, I want it to be easy for downstreams um, or third party projects to be able to spin up their own um, syscaller instances um, against you know, either stock FreeBSD or their own, um, their own derivative. Um, you know, ideally, like you could, if you have some Oracle Cloud credentials, right, you can just run one Terraform uh, uh, script and, and have basically a, a sys, sysbot of your own instantiated and, and running against your. Uh, your, your private kit tree or whatever this might be. So we have another question about syscaller and it's basically, is there any documentation how to run it by yourself? Yeah, uh, there's a there's a docs folder in the in the syscaller repo, which is um, GitHub, uh, Google syscaller. Um, and there's some setup instructions for running it on, or for, for fuzzing FreeBSD. So you can, so, I mean, uh, I don't, I don't want to, Go off into the weeds too much because there's there's quite a lot of information about this on the internet already. But you know the general gist of it is you you have a host which runs a sort of manager which um, has the ability to spin up any number of VMs which run the, the the kernel being fuzzed. So the manager can be Linux or FreeBSD or whatever you want, and you can use you know QMU or Beehive or or um, I think only GCE at the moment as far as cloud providers go. So there, there's a bunch of different ways to run uh, uh, guests that get fuzzed. Um, so depending on what your requirements are and what hardware you have available to you or, or don't have, um, yeah, the, the, the setup might be slightly different. But yeah, in general, you, you know, you grab the sources, build them, write a little configuration file which specifies a bunch of, um, uh, you know, parameters, things like the number of uh, VMs and, and resources to give it, and uh, you can take um, a FreeBSD image, like a VM image, and use that as the, as the uh, as the base for for everything, um, so I can perhaps put a link on the Dev Summit wiki um, after after the talk's over. But uh, yeah, there is a docs folder with with FreeBSD specific setup and instructions. Just out of curiosity, have you used any reproducers to generate um, regression tests uh, for FreeBSD? So, uh, so there isn't really, so there's nothing that currently runs as part of our post commit CI. Um, I collect all of the reproducers in a, in a repository and I do, I have a bit of automation for running them, but um, that's not hooked into anything. And I, I can see that Peter Holm checks some of those into stress too, and those do get run regularly. Um, so if, if you look in the stress two directory, you'll see probably 60 or 70 different syscall reproducers. Um, and they're, they're still available in, in sysbot as well. Um, uh, so, the, I mean, th those are available forever and, and yeah, again, I, I, I personally collect the ones that I've, um, found using a private instance. Um, but yes, they, they do tend to turn into useful regression tests. Um, and as Ed said, you know, uh, uh, a pre-commit CI job that would fuzz uh, a patch set for, for several hours would be, would be a huge, uh, a huge help. Because I mean, I do that for for developers even now, but it's it's currently manual. Like they have to mail me and say, "Oh, hey, can you fuzz this?" So automating that is is going to be one of my. Or, I mean, it's something I'm actively working on. Um, I see one more question um, over on the YouTube uh, stream. Um, can this color be used for bare metal or VMware VMs? I would love to see this used on AR64. <sighs> um. Can it be used on bare metal? I think so. I've never done that. Um, and I think there's a bunch of caveats with doing that because, you know, this caller does all sorts of horrible things to the file system. Um, so you, after a reset, you know, after a panic, say you really want to restore the system to, um, a, a, you know, a sort of a known good state. So if you boot disklessly, um, that might be pretty, that might be pretty easy to do. Um, I, yeah, I, I do think it's possible. Um, I just don't have much personal experience with it. You might have to trawl through the, the syscaller docs a bit. Um, and VMware, uh, I'm not sure if, 
So I mean, uh, Syscaller has a bunch of sort of drivers for different hypervisors. Uh, there is a VMware driver. I've never used it myself. Um, so I mean, in principle, the answer is yes, but uh, you'd have to look into it a bit more. I mostly fuzz with Beehive and Syspod uses GCE, um, but you can use yeah, QMU with KVM if you're on Linux or, or um, uh, I think there is GVisor support as well. Um, so there's, there's quite a few different ways to, yeah. So yeah, the answer is a qualified yes. All right, and I think with that, we'll um, uh, go on to uh, our last topic, um, which is proactive security, um, which included both Capsicum and uh, Cherry, but um, we, uh, first of all, don't have enough time, and uh, Brooks um, talked about Cherry extensively uh, already, so um, we'll just, we'll, we'll focus just on Capsicum for this, um, uh, this topic. So uh, if you haven't heard about Capsicum, it's a lightweight uh, OS capability and sandbox frame framework, which basically, I mean, putting it in simple words, this is how we would like to sandbox our processes. And the main idea of it is that, you know, uh, you don't have any access to the global namespace. So for example, if you want to open some uh, connection, remote connection, or you want to open some file, you have to delegate this uh, to the different a process who actually have the capability to do so or capability to the um, file that that you want to have and um, to make it easier for people to use it we also develop a service called casper which is basically a library which allows us to um, access in secure way to different uh, namespaces um, and in um, uh, recently, we developed two major uh, services, the file system one and the network one, uh, which basically allows you to access those two namespaces. Um, unfortunately, we still see um, quite small uh, adaptations uh, in um, the user land applications. And uh, this is something that we, I personally would like to discuss. And, uh, you know, if you have uh, any ideas or you um, try it and you think that it's um, still uh, challenging to sandbox um, applications using those uh, two um, services. And then I would like to know about that. Uh, besides that, recently we also put a lot of effort with uh, fully uh, supporting Beehive. Currently, if you are using um, a feature called um, checkpoints, if I recall correctly, uh, then uh, the Capsicum and uh, Capsicum support is disabled. And there was a major uh, work done um, to, to support it, but it's still um, in review. Uh, as well, uh, there was a lot of work put by uh, Mateusz. Um, in the uh, area of optimizations, uh, especially in the um, kernel space. Um, for example, uh, how we calculate uh, capabilities and how we use them. So this was a very, very, uh, very extensive uh, work from, from him. And uh, if we go to the next slide, this is a sm very small summary what uh, happened recently in, in Capsicum world. And basically I would, really would like to have uh, some uh, discussion of what is still missing in Capsicum and what we can actually do to make it easier for, for developers to uh, work with it and use it in their applications. Because um, I feel that uh, the um, adaptation process in, in uh, FreeBSD um, slowed down. Uh, and this is something that I would really like to uh, get on track with that. Um, I also think that if you are a, a new person, newcomer in FreeBSD, um, it's a very good project to uh, look into because basically you have to work with the uh, Unix tools that you use every day and try to sandbox them. So this is something that can um, create a great opportunity for contributions as well. Yeah, um, I think um, I would very much um, like to see um, uh, a focus on uh, Capscom, uh, adopting Capscom in um, 
third party ports of particular interest to us. So, you know, things like uh, if we're using the Git, um, uh, uh, Git server um, uh, or uh, OpenB uh, from, from the OpenBSD project um, got uh, Game of Trees. Um, one of my co-op students did some work to, to start applying Capsicum to, um, to that. Unfortunately, the, the term ended and we haven't been able to continue um, with that, that under the, the co-op program. But, um, but certainly, you know, there's, there's a, uh, a handful of relatively easily identified ports um, that I think would be very um, useful uh, targets for, um, for Capsicum application. Uh, yes, so if you haven't uh, came across Capsicum before, there is a nice uh, wiki page uh, on uh, FreeBSD Wiki, uh, which describes some um, targets that you can find useful as well. But uh, I think that, uh, like Ed mentioned, that that's, this is a very good idea also to put some uh, third party ports that we would uh, like to see, or we think that would be quite easy to sandbox at this point. Um. So from IRC, we have a comment uh, from Crest that says, uh, IMO Capsicum is a really nice and clean design, which is why it fails to gain adoption. Uh, <laughs> um, question about whether hard, Fetch- hard to not, agree, not to agree. <laughs> does Fetch use Capsicum? Um, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I don't believe Fetch does I right don't now. Do either, but let me just quickly yeah. drag that. Um, that I looked at Capsicum really early on and didn't quite get it. I need to look at it again. Uh, I, I think that is, um, um, I think that is fundamentally something that we need to try to address through either tutorial videos or documentation or tutorials about applying it or whatever, um, because I think one of the key, um, the key parts is you need to sort of have that light bulb moment to realize the distinction between um, you know, a syscall limitation, like basically reducing classes of syscalls, which Capsicum does, but it's, it's sort of incidental to the real, um, the real point, right, of, of basically once, once that like idea of global namespaces and ambient authority as what you're limiting um, uh, kind of clicks, then the fact that certain syscalls are not available you know, it's not, it, it, that's sort of the natural consequence of, well, those syscalls only, only act on um, global namespaces. And so that's, 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 the, that's the fundamental reason why they're not available. It's not because they're, it, it's not because that syscall is dangerous, it's because that syscall just is meaningless when your model is that the, um, uh, the global namespace or ambient authority. So, so, so basically it's putting it, it's maybe uh, straightforward is that you have to have capability to use particular Cisco, right? For example, the file descriptor to, uh, from which you have to read. And if there is a Cisco that, you know, don't have any particular capabilities, it's just uh, denied or uh, restricted in uh, Capsicum. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, there is a question on Zoom. Uh, so uh, basically, if you have uh, uh, the question is um, how does Capsicum interact with OPATH, empty path, and the app syscalls? Is the path only descriptor already a capability for accessing the file? So. Uh, the capability is actually the file descriptor to particular file or to the directory in which the directory uh, in which the file is. So, for example, if you want to open some particular file, you have to have a uh, descriptor to this directory in which the file is, or you have to uh, ask the uh, process that have access to this file to open it for it and pass it through, for example, unique domain socket. Okay, I think um, uh, John wants us to wrap up um, uh, shortly, so uh, we can continue this discussion uh, certainly in the, um, the hallway track. Um, but uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark and Reyes, and uh, we'll talk again in the tra hallway, track, hallway track in a moment. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you all. Um, as Ed noted, it's time now for our last break of the day. Um, 
we're going to have another break for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll come back. Um, we have one more talk today, which is uh, uh, kind of more of a laid back, just um, open ended talk with Jordan Hubbard talking about some of Fribius' early history. Um, so we'll see you back in about 20 minutes or so.